So, all right, let's get started. Let me um, pray, and then we will have uh, some questions, which if you don't have questions after that sermon, you weren't listening, okay? So let's pray real quick. Father, um, there are so many questions that we have that, um, that we know, and we, especially what we just talked about, that your word reveals to us, but sometimes it's the, the, the Holy Spirit reveals little by little the interpretation, illuminates and supplies them in a way that the circumstances of our lives do have to catch up to. And so quite often it can be so confusing, and especially in the world in which we live, where there are so many disparate voices within the church itself teaching different things. Um, I know that this particular doctrine is one that um, uh, garners quite a bit of controversy. And so I pray that uh, I'll be able to answer all the questions uh, and that uh, we'll, 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 we'll understand fully because it has been, uh, as so many things are, it has been clouded by the enemy because he loves it when we, we, we um, uh, get divided over things that we really shouldn't be divided over. So I, I just ask your blessing on that. Uh, and the rest of this uh, morning's meeting in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, any um, questions that you would like to ask about the text? Yes, ma'am, Miss Patty. So, um, when, you, when we talk about that, you know, I don't believe in signs, but sometimes there's things that you do that you feel like God's telling you to do it, but mm-hmm. I Uh, let, let me expand on that question because that question has already been asked me. Um, and so, because uh, I realize that is one of the questions that arises from this text or from a message like this one. Um, because the, there's two things that we are accused of one is putting the Holy Spirit in a box. What happens? Are you saying the Holy Spirit can't work? Are you saying that he, we don't ask him to reveal things to us? We don't throw up a fleece? We don't do all of these things? And secondly, we are accused of making an idol out of Scripture, of turning the Bible into an idol, that we put so much emphasis on the Word of God that we put the Holy Spirit in a box. So let, let, let me answer your question and then expand that because um, there, uh, we, we are really not putting the Holy Spirit in a box at all. In fact, we are saying that we heavily depend on the work of the Holy Spirit. But what we are saying is this, is that when God speaks to us today, he speaks to us through his word as it is illuminated and interpreted by the Holy Spirit and applied to every situation as it arises. So it seems like, okay, I'm going to pray for God to to give me the answer or to give me direction. We pray for direction all the time. We pray for guidance all the time. And, And so, but what we're praying for is exactly what Jesus said, which is that the helper is coming And when he comes, he will bring to your remembrance, first of all, talking to the apostles who are going to write it down, but through them, I'm not just praying for them, but all those who will come to faith through them, praying to us, and he's bringing to our remembrance the the discerning factors that the scripture has taught us, okay? Now, that goes on every day. That should go on every day in a Christian life. The last thing that I am saying, and the reason when I say that the enemy gets in the details and he, he creates straw men to force us farther apart to an either-or situation that simply isn't an either-or situation. We're not saying that the Holy Spirit's hands are bound, that the Holy Spirit cannot direct us, reveal things to us, um, and, and actually, in a sense, speak to us. But what is speaking, the way that he reveals himself to us today is through this book, his word, and 
the illumination of the Spirit in our hearts and minds at that moment. So in other words, I've got a decision I need to make. I have something. Now, the, 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 the situation that was brought up to me was about a year ago. The elders of this church got together. Um, we had a piece of property that, as you know, we were considering uh, purchasing. And there were all kinds of things. And so we asked for guidance. That was primarily what we asked for. And we spelled out all the ifs and, the, you know, here's what we have. But literally what we're asking for is good solid guidance about what decision to make. Now, we set some boundaries to that. I mean, it wasn't a fleece. It's just saying that please help us understand that if these things come about, that we would have the discernment to know that this isn't the right deal. Those things came about, and we had the discernment to know that that wasn't the right deal and to walk away. Now, there's two ways you can look at that. You could say we got together and we threw up a fleece, that we ask God to show us in a supernatural way what, what he wanted us to do. But, or, or else we can say that God working in a supernatural way brought to our remembrance all that we need to know from the revealed word, which is his word, and applied it to the situation that we were in. Now, one is 100% scriptural. The other is, well, it worked for Gideon, right? You know, it, it, it was a, a fleece then, but that doesn't mean that that was the method of determining. They used to determine the will of God by throwing dice. And, 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 and so much of that was prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost. So just like there is a new method of revelation, there's a new method of salvation, even though it is tightly put together with the salvation of the Old Testament, there's a new method of salvation through the cross work of Jesus Christ. What I showed you earlier is that is clearly established in the Old Testament. It's the fulfillment of that. Does that make sense? So in other words, we are not saying in any way, form, or fashion, that's what I tried to say, I'm not putting Holy Spirit in a box. What I'm putting in a box are the guys who say they're speaking on behalf of God when they're not. When they're, whatever comes into my mind is what God is speaking to me. Now, unfortunately, they're so close. It's, very, it's a nuance between two people. Now, no blanket, no broad brushes, but in general, the people who are having the most supernatural revelations from God are the people who spend the least time in the Word. And the people who spend the most time in the Word are coming to the realization that God speaks through His Word and illumination, exactly what I just said. So when you see people running around the room acting like chickens, barking like dogs, squirming on the floor because the Holy Spirit has got a hold of them and they're doing those things, they'd spend zero time in the Word. They're not studying the Word, or they would realize that, hey, that's not the way the Holy Spirit works. You know, but it's all experiential. It's all on the outside. None of it comes from, because the reason the Holy Spirit is not revealing the Word of God to them is because they don't know the Word of God. You can't have the, the Word of God revealed to you if you don't know it. He can't build upon it. He can't add to it. He can't apply it if you don't know it. So what happens is that Whatever is in my mind becomes the word of God. That's what the whole word of faith movement is built on. One of the biggest mass movements in church today is the word of faith movement. And the word of faith movement is I've got a word and I'm going to meditate on it and believe in it and that word's going to happen because God will respect my belief. Now, that's not the Holy Spirit bringing to our remembrance what he has taught, the ethical standards that he has taught in his Bible, in his word. So there's a, in some minds, a subtle difference, not in mine. In my mind, that's all the difference in the world. Because in one mind, you've got to be in the Word. You, you've, you've got to know the Word of God. Now, again, that would be putting the Holy Spirit in a box if I said the only time He can speak to you is if you know the Word. Because He does reveal the Word to us, bring into our remembrance, guide us into all truth. He can guide us into the Word, to the words that we need to, to know. So there's, not an, there's no part of this 
that is putting God in a box. I mean, obviously it wouldn't be true if it was. Naomi, you, you, you've got your... I'm um, just thinking about Second Peter, um, first chapter and the third verse. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So he has given us the answer to anything that's pertaining to life. Or, so you're talking, he's talking about life and godliness. So that's given us the understanding of the spiritual things of our life as well as the worldly things of our life. And I found that anything that I need to know is in the Word. Absolutely. Well, they, it's things I'm dealing with, with a daily thing, with the answers to things that's going on in spiritually and, and, and I 100% agree with you is that everything we need to know is in the word of God it does not mean and people say this to me sometimes okay it doesn't say anything about marijuana in the book of, of, of God does that mean it's right or wrong well at the time people were asking me that it was illegal <laughs> uh, answer to your question you know, there, there are other things in the word of God that will lead you to the proper response. And, and, and so it's, it's not that it has to cover every single detail of every single thing, like being sober. Um, and or um, another thing that is, is uh, um, um, people are trying to say now is that, um, that the Bible doesn't say anything about uh, changing your gender or uh, being transgender in that way. Well, I mean, come on. I, I mean, there's enough discussion of other things that apply to that definitively that that's really a ridiculous uh, supposition. Right, right. He made them in such a way. So, I mean, it's clearly there. Um, you, you know, uh, when I teach marriage... And actually, I do the same thing when I teach parenting. Um, I don't, the, the whole first lesson on marriage, I, I hardly even mention marriage. I, I, I don't talk, if, if you're going to learn what the Bible says about marriage, it, it, you're not going to do a search on the word marriage and, and, and get what it says. There's not a whole bunch of verses that actually speak with marriage. But from the very beginning of the book to the very end of the book, it talks about our relationship with each other, our relationship with, with humanity, our relationship with God, and what God wants out of us. And so therefore, if I can teach the fundamentals, most of the marital couples that I've had that you know, come in, they always wait till they're about to split before they come to counseling, so they're already so angry and hateful at each other, it you know, it's, turns into a free-for-all. Um, but it, I, I tell them, if I could teach you to, to treat each other like Christians, that would end your marital problems right there. So if I could just teach you to be a good Christian male, and I could teach you to be a good Christian woman, and I could tell you in this relationship of what it means and the few things that Paul and, uh, and the other uh, parts say about marriage, then you're going to have a fantastic marriage because you're going to treat each other's in a Christ-like manner. And that's all you need, right? There's the foundation. But if you do a search for marriage, you're not going to find that. It's the principles that the Bible teaches that applied. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He takes his principles and he applies it to a particular situation. And that's what we call fresh revelation, but it's really not. It's exactly what Jesus talked about. He is bringing to our remembrance what he has told us, he's not speaking on his own account, but he's speaking on Christ's account, and he is bringing it to our remembrance in the situation that we are in so that we can apply it. And that's why it's so important for us to be in the Word, because the more in the Word we are, the more we know, the deeper we go into it, the more we recognize of how to deal with our situations. Yes, sir. 
My question is, um, I still can wrap it up my head on that rich man um, who's in a tummy place. Yeah. Uh, and to be able to ask him all that question, is it a, because, is it a parable or is it a on really life? Yeah. It, it's, the, the, the question is, is the conversation between the rich man in hell and Abraham in heaven, is that a parable or is that real life? Definitively, it's a parable. Um, there is no communication between heaven and hell in that way, in, in the way that someone in heaven is going to be able to see someone in hell. Just put, just put Abraham in, in that situation. Abraham, of course, being a man of faith. And Abraham tenderly refers to this man as child, okay? knowing that I'm your father, you're my child. I mean, could you see your child in the kind of torment that he is in without it bringing sorrow to you? Tears to your eyes, but there's no sorrow in heaven. There's no tears in heaven, so that can't happen. So if you could see, even if you could see what was going on on earth, it would bring tears to your eyes. Uh, so, so therefore, no, there is a separation, as he says, there's a gulf between us that cannot be bridged, and, and it's vast. And so therefore, no, it's a, Jesus is using that in a parable to make a point. And the point is that um, uh, that that our, we, there are consequences to our actions, but this is the major premise. What we hit today, this is the major premise of the parable, which is where can truth be found, and it's not in spectacular sensationalism. It's, it's in the Word of God. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I got a question now. My question is, you know, like. Um, well, DJ, do stay with me. Stay with me overnight. We pray. And the prayer thing, I, I, I'm going to ask this question about lining up with God's will and what I'm asking for. Right. So, how do I get there? And how, I mean, when John said that what I ask, what you ask, I will give it to you. Right. So, the giving part, I, I want to know okay. how I do. But my prayers, I mean, I know it's, it's, it's my obedience, but then how I say it is that simple like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, 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 you let a really important clause out of that statement. Whatever you ask in my name. Right. No, I will no. give you, okay? Just don't, don't, don't leave that out because that's, that, that's, the, most, that's the most important thing. And you knew, and you knew I was going to, I was going to nail you on it, okay? Well, yeah. That's the issue. Okay, that's the issue. Right. 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 Everything I ask you, you should, you should answer, no, but I'm saying as a Christian, I need to learn how, yeah. or, or is there a way to? Well, let me, let, let, me, let me use David as an example. David is a man who is a man after God's own heart, all right? So we can look to him as an example, a type of Christ, very, very closely connected. What happened when his son by Bathsheba was sick? What did he do? He sackcloth and ashes and prayers and mourning and crying. Then the boy died. So what did he do? Get mad at God. How could you take my son? Go and mourn for a month. No, he got up. He washed his face, put on new fresh clothes. And they said, hey, what happened? He said, he's gone. I, I can't change that. That was God's will. Okay, so I pray that God would hear my voice and would, that would, would, would answer my prayer. And he never wants us to stop because that's huge because that means we are turning to him for our solutions rather than trying to do our solutions ourselves. So the prayers that we say have more to do with our own growth and uh, uh, edification than they do about changing God's mind. God wouldn't be God if we could change his mind. But by the same token, what he wants you to do is continue praying. Now, what happens as you, 
as you are blessed through the means of grace. Means of grace, the word, prayer, sacraments, worship. These things begin to change you. Even though your heart, your soul has changed, you've still got this fleshly body, right? That you're struggling with. And so what happens as you grow in grace through these means of grace, studying the word, praying, going to, 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 to worship, taking the sacraments, uh, doing the things of the Christian that do, what happens is that your will begins to be changed from a will that is all about me to a will that wants his will first. So when we go to him and we say, God, I... I, I Lord, I need you to save my daughter. Uh, and, and Kay and I with, 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 with Ashley, when, when we were that close to, to, to losing her leg. Lord, please don't take her. I mean, over and over and over and over again, we prayed for that. If the Lord had taken her leg, we would have got up and said, Lord, you, you know best. It's your will. We prayed otherwise, but we would have been wrong for whatever you have got planned for her. Praise God, he didn't do that. Praise God, he did answer our prayers. That doesn't mean we're better prayers. It doesn't mean that that's the way it's going to stay. It means for right now, God has answered our prayer because it's his will. Now, when we grow closer to him, our will becomes to reflect his. And that's really when our prayers become so powerful. And that's why God wants his people praying. It's because as we gather together as a congregation and we begin to pray his will, not ours, that his will be done, not ours, then we, those prayers become hugely effective. So Powerful. When, as you've been brought over to Christ, then you're not just, you're not, you don't own yourself no more, then you're, you, you belong to him. You belong to him. The so trouble is, is nobody tells your sinful body that right off the bat. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody tells that sinful body, that flesh that wants to keep on doing the same thing that it's doing, and, and the flesh fights against that, that redeemed soul that you've got. So immediately, Christianity, I mean, the greatest misconception about Christianity is that when you accept Jesus Christ, everything is roses from there. Okay? That's when the fight begins. I didn't know what a fight was until I came to know Christ. Because my life was totally unacceptable. And, and, and a lot of things had to change. And one by one, they, they, they were changed. Until I, I, I'm, I'm to the point where now, the, the thought of the way I used to think normal is, is, un, is un, unheard of as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. Language every day and change and, and, uh -huh. and do thoughts or whatever. The process of sanctification is a process whereby we become Christ-like. And it is a process that begins as soon as our hearts are changed. And it is a process that will end when either Jesus comes back or we go to him and we are glorified. Uh, between now and then, there's going to be a constant fight. I, I was reading John Owen just yesterday, uh, briefly, and I, I, I read, I like him because he's got little short chapters, you know, and, and you can pick him up and read him and then put him in. He's one of, the, one of the Puritans, going back to the Puritan age. And, and he was talking about the, the, the blind attacks that Satan does on believers, on seasoned believers. Okay, and you're going along just fine, and you know you're you're feeling like uh, things are going along, and all of a sudden you just get hit with either an old temptation or sometimes a brand new one that shows you how you really haven't dealt with the old one yet. And so he he was saying that all right, what you do in these times is really important, okay, because. You know, if, if, if you fold or you've been to that temptation, it means you never really learned your lesson in the first place, that so you're just putting on a show. And that quite often God does this to continue to bring that mirror out so that we continue to learn and continue to be tested. So the, the onslaught of Satan against the elect, it, it never stops. It actually, it never slows down. The only time it slows down is if you decide to park yourself and 
wait till Jesus comes home. You know. But well, sanctification, so as the sanctification process strengthens, then you'll be more like Christ, like you're saying, and then, then, then God can hear your prayers. Right. Well, no, no, he, he hears your prayers. Okay. Um, the terminology there is important. There is not a prayer that a believer prays that he doesn't hear. It doesn't mean he's going to answer it. And it doesn't mean he's going to grant you what you pray for. But he hears every single one of them. And they're registered. Now, unbelievers, unlike what the culture says, and I cringe every time I see the culture talking about praying to the man upstairs, you know, and, and you know, the, the, the great movies that, we, that most of us know and love, like uh, um, A Wonderful Life, right? What, what happens, I'm not a praying man sitting at a bar, right? I'm not a praying man, but if you're there, would you fix what's wrong with me? So God sends an angel down to fix what's wrong with them. No, that, that doesn't happen. God does not hear the prayers of unbelievers. There's one prayer of an unbeliever that God hears. That's the prayer of repentance, the prayer of accepting Christ as Savior. He hears that because he instigates it. But the believer, he hears every prayer, every thought, every cry, whether we're down on our knees for an hour's worth of prayer or whether we're driving down the street and talking to God in our head. There is never a prayer that he doesn't hear. And, and he, he doesn't like flippant prayers, okay? And flippant prayers of believers, I think, work against us, okay? I mean, that, that's something we don't want to... We, every time we go to the Lord, even if we're driving down the street, we want it to be reverent, recognizing who we're speaking to. So, you know, to, to, to say that you've got to go get in your closet and assume a position... That's really a good thing to do. I'm all for it. Um, but that's not the only way you can pray. Yes? Um, in the Old Testament, if the Israelites had a decision to make, like go to war with a pagan nation, they would go to a prophet, and the prophet would say, yes, God is with you, or no, no, you can't. And sometimes, of course, they ignored the prophet, and they went, and you know, they got their butt kicked. Right. So to speak. But... Um, but now, uh, we don't have that. I don't believe in any of these modern prophets. So if I have a decision to make, I'm not talking about asking God for something, but sometimes you have a decision to make and you have no information to know whether to go with door number one or door number two. You know, so my attitude is, and this is my question, is this the right way to look at it, is I'll ask God which way I should go, and I don't hear God's voice, I don't hear the Holy Spirit's voice, but I just feel like, okay, then, but I just because I turned it over to God, now I have confidence that whichever decision I make, He's leading me to that one. Is that? That, that, that is, I, I would say you're right on. Let, let, let's back up with that just a wee bit. Um, there are probably more. I'm not thinking systematically, but I can think of three ways in the Old Testament right off the bat that people would discern the will of God. Um, we have Gideon and the fleece. Okay, I'm going to put a fleece out, and if, this is, if, if the dew's on it, and, and he did it twice. So what he's doing is using a fleece to try to discern the will of God. It absolutely was a lack of faith. But then there was the, 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 um, the thumbing and, and uh, the what's in thumbing? The, yeah, the, the dice. Yeah. What, what, what's the first one? Is it Uman and Thummim? Yeah. Okay. Um, the Uman and Thummim, and they would regularly use that. I mean, as late as Acts 1, they're throwing dice to see which apostle to replace Judas. Um, so that was a, a way prior to the Holy... Now, there's no indication after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that they continue to do that. But there's asking for fleeces, there's the omen and thumbin, um, and then there's a, a direct a question, would you please direct us in some way through the prophets, okay? So there were three ways that we know that in the Old Testament, they would discern what God wanted them to do. 
Now, with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the consummation of all those Old Testament cultic events in Jesus Christ, well, some of the things that go on in the New Testament are, are somewhat different. And so we don't see any throwing dice to get God's will because the Holy Spirit, as Jesus says, brings to our remembrance what we know from his word. Now, I believe that when you, and, and, and I tell people, probably I shouldn't tell people to do this, um, but I, 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 if I have a really tough decision to make, and I don't know what the Lord's will is, well, the first thing that I do is I try to establish, and I know the Lord knows this already, but I try to establish that, Lord, really what I want to do is your will. I don't want to do my will. If I could have my druthers, if I could have what I would like, you would speak from heaven to me today and tell me what to do. I really don't want to make the wrong decision. I want to do whatever your will is, even if it doesn't fit. And uh, so then I, I utilize the gifts that God has given me to make value judgments. You remember, God made you as you are. He's refining you and making you better through sanctification, but he made you and gave you logical ability to make decisions based on criteria. The most important thing about that is that the criteria needs to be scriptural. Now, let me, let me use an example. When I was called on to be the preacher here 20 years ago, Okay, I first refused. I refused for a year. Okay, because I, I disagree with the CRC uh, on, on many of their, some of their things, as you all know. But I, I really didn't see myself being called. I wanted to be a missionary too. And so I, I really didn't know what God's will for me was. So I kept praying, Lord, you know, uh, uh, what is it that you want me to do? I, I want your will to be done. And I want it to be done in, in a definitive way. In other words, I want to know that what I'm doing is, is your will. I don't want it to be emotion. I don't want it to be a feeling. I want your will to be done in my life. The trouble is, is I've got a decision to make, and I've got to choose door number one, as you said, or door number two. Which one do I go in? Well, I tend to choose the door that I don't want. Whether that's the right thing to do or not, I can't tell you but I tend to go the other direction, okay? Um, if I really felt that the Lord was calling me to be here, my emotions fail me. My feelings fail me constantly. I cannot put any trust in my emotions. I feel that it's right. It's just right, right on as far as, and, and it's wrong every time. Uh, it, and, and I find that out later on. So what I really want is God's will. And if I have to make a choice at that moment, then I'm going to make the choice that is the least attractive to me with the understanding that, Lord, if this is not the one, I trust you to direct me to the one that is your will. Because what I really want is your will. I just want that too bad. And, and, and I'm not objective. Or, uh, I'm way too subjective. I really want that. And how do I ever know that I didn't choose that because I wanted it and not because what you wanted? So I'll actually gravitate towards the other one and, and every time the Lord has pulled me back. Now, that's not, that's not calling on a sign. That's just simply saying that I know you have a will for my life and I, want that. I don't want to make any mistakes. And so there I, I have to make a decision and I am depending on you, as you said, to lead me in the right direction. That's, that's obviously God's not in a box because he's right there in the midst of that. So as what Will and I were talking about earlier um, is that there's such a terrible misconception that if you believe in the, in the power and the authority of Scripture that you in some way are cutting the Spirit of God short. But that's just not true. In fact, uh, to me, it's just the opposite. Because if, if I'm saying God is speaking through my, my head, 
boy, am I cutting him short. <laughs> you know, I mean, what a difference between having the revealed word of God on one hand and, and my silly feelings on another. So um, these are, these are uh, issues that constantly come up that plague many people. And unfortunately, I think more people are of the nature, God, show me a sign. Show me, show me the way. You know, show me, if, if this is what you want, then make this happen. I can't tell you how many times, uh, I, early in my walk, I said, make this happen. If you wanted to, it would happen, and it was absolutely the wrong thing. And, and of course, I learned my lessons through that, but it, it doesn't mean we're not talking about uh, um, the, the Lord working in our lives. Yes, ma'am. Along those same lines, I know someone who is going to be making a drastic change in her life. Is she believes that reading out of Exodus that God has promised her the promised land somewhere in central Florida. And she keeps reading and finding confirmation in these random scriptures. How, how do you talk against that? How do you well, know? One, one, one thing you can tell her is that's, That's why, why the people, people who follow Jim Jones, Jones to... <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking. That's exactly what I am. He is finding scripture to say that God is leading us to the promise. And, and follow me. They all follow them. They, they all know that. Okay? And that, that, that's, that's, to me, that's a powerful argument. Because that's exactly what he was doing. He's twisting scripture and finding in it what he wanted to say. Yeah. Now, if, 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 you get the ear, if they're listening to you, say, please read the passage, not just the verse, read the whole passage, and then put it in its context. What is God talking about? Is he talking about you moving to Central Florida? I mean, is there anywhere in that that he's talking about that? I mean, look at it from every angle you can, and you won't find it unless you take it out of context. And that's the huge problem. But if you don't have her ear, she's not going to listen to that. Yeah. You know, She's going to be convinced that God is speaking to her through the word, right? You open it up, and you know, I used to love what Steve Brown would say about that. So every time I do that, I, I, I end up on something like, and they killed all the Philistines, man, woman, and child. You know, it's like, well, what am I supposed to do? Is, you know, <laughs> But uh, that, that is so, that, you know, but where did she even get to that point? Where did she get to the point where she thinks that God is speaking to her by connecting all these spiritual dots? Well, they're into that, and that's the problem. That's the problem. You listen to some of these guys, and you listen to their exposition of Scripture. It's the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen because they're picking this passage, this passage, this passage, this. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. Okay, that's how they justify what they do. That's how the Mormons do. And of course, there's, they, they're, they're, not, they're not reading the word as it is. So try to get her to, to, to ask the question, Does, did God write this for you to make that decision? But that's exactly the point. When I say it was devastating to the church, it is devastating to the church because that's what's being taught from the pulpit and that's what people believe they need to do in their lives. And so you have something and you actually start looking for verses here and there. It's, it's, you're trying to be self-directed. I mean, the arrogance that's involved in it is, for me, it's my fault. Yes, and, but it's very sad when you see that at home and you see people actually doing that. You know. Yes, ma'am, Miss Rhonda. So following up on Sonia's question, um, does that relate or does that not relate to something like um, you know, the little booklets today in the word, where it's just a little snippet and then teaching on that, and then the next day a little snippet from someplace else and a little teaching about that. Uh, I don't, I don't. Okay, and the question is, in case uh, that didn't pick up on the mics, what about the devotions? 
the, in the Word, um, the, the day in the Word, where you have a little snippet and then a lesson on that. I think a great example of that is um, uh, Charles Spurgeon and his morning and evening and his checkbook of faith. Um, Kay and I read those over the years um, and along with scripture in our devotions. And uh, sometimes he's a little bit out there. You know what I mean? He's using a scripture and, and he's kind of just a wee bit out there. But I don't think there's anything wrong in a devotion Okay, because what, uh, for the most part, 99% of the part, if they are good, solid writers, what they are doing is bringing out um, that verse, but keying on just maybe one or two verses out of a bigger passage. If they're doing it well, they're not taking it out of context. They're just not giving you the context, right? They're just giving you the poignant part of it. Like, for instance, this morning. If I wanted to, and there are so many uh, preachers, I read a lot of other preachers' uh, commentaries and, and verses, and, 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 and Spurgeon was like this. If Spurgeon was preaching on this passage this morning, you would have had, um, what is it? Verse 29. Okay, that's all you would have had. That would have been his text for the day. And they have Moses and the prophets. That would be it. Now, that doesn't mean that he wouldn't give the entire context in what he says. Or he would be true to the context. It just means that that was a way, that's a way that many pastors would do it. They would just take one verse, and that would be their scripture verse, and then they would expand on everything uh, around it. Since I'm expositional, since I'm going through the word line by line, then I give the whole passage as part of that. Um, so it depends on how they are utilizing that one verse that they pull out. Are they utilizing to say something that has totally does not jive with the, the, the context? And, and, and a great example. Let me give you a, a great example of that. If I can find it. I'm, I'm not good. I, I admire guys like MacArthur who he just flips back and forth in his Bible, you know, and he finds exactly where he, where he wants to find it, when he wants to find it. Um, <clears throat> well, I can't. And some of you are going to know it, and you're, you'll embarrass me because you know better than I know it. But when Peter says, um, or, or maybe it's even Paul that says it in, in Romans, that he does not wish, it, it does not delight that any of the, um, the, the unrighteous would, would suffer, that he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Um, and, and that is used as a powerful argument against predestination and election. Okay? And, but the problem is, is they, they don't read the whole chapter because Peter is one of the most predestinational writers in the Bible, right? I mean, you just can't get around it. It's just everywhere that he talks about. The, and in fact, going back to the beginning, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dress to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I mean, that's the way he starts his, his book. That's the context. So if he says that it doesn't please God that any of the wicked would perish, well, he's saying that within the context of that, well, I'm talking specifically to, to the elect here. And so I, I'm, everything I say is within the context of that. So, and, and again, I, I kind of butchered that because I forgot uh, what, exactly his passage. But, but nonetheless, that's the problem. If you take passages out of context, you, you, what you end up with is believing that it says one thing when actually it says something exactly the opposite. Right? It's within the context that is so important.
Yes, sir. Preachers that you were talking about, right? It's, and Paul said that if any of them come preaching any other gospel, let them be a curse. So, and then, like, I don't know if it's the Galatians or who he was saying that you've been bewitched. Right. You know, you know you've been bewitched. Who bewitched you? You know, like, I, I just left you and now here, here you hear somebody come along and teach. Same thing, but so therefore, it's the importance of knowing the word and knowing what it says. Just like we were talking about just now about taking a little small parts and then change it, and then and that's just what to do with with the, with, the, with the, the people. It's just like we were talking about the people in Jonestown. You know, it's, it's then he told them to throw the Bible away. See, so uh, so it's uh, like listen to me. Don't pay attention to me. Yeah. Don't pay attention to me. And, 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 you know, it, it, it would seem that we would learn our lessons because one of the reasons people don't keep making the same mistakes is because they don't know church history. That's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church did. All right? We're going to put the Bible in a language you don't understand. We're going to hold the service in a language you don't understand. We are going to put a priest between you and the Word of God. You have no salvation except through that priest. And so it is, they never listened or paid attention or read the word of God ever. And for Martin Luther to do what he did, which is to translate the New Testament into German, was the greatest blasphemy and heresy, according to them, that he could have done. So, so right, so to keep them away from the word of God is the most important thing. Yeah. Well, the Pope, according to them, is, well, going back in history, originally the Pope was the only one who could interpret Scripture. So they said, Scripture is wonderful. We're all for Scripture, but what does it mean? Only the Pope can tell us. That was until there was the break, and all of a sudden there's two Popes. There's the Pope at Avignon, the Pope in Rome, and they're fighting. They've already anathesized each other. They've condemned each other. Both of them uh, uh, discommunicated them, incommunicated them, whatever it is, whatever it is. And then, so the councils of the church took over and said, well, we have to be the ones who are the ultimate authority. And then they appointed a third Pope. So now they got three Popes. Okay, each one of them are supposed to be infallible in their interpretation of Scripture. And from that point on, it was the Pope, the councils of the church, and the traditions of the church. And that's the way that God speaks to them. All right, so yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's the interpretation through a very tightly held group of people. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Rhonda. So I, I still want to come back. I still want to... Uh, continue to ask about decision making. So um, so setting aside Roman Catholics and setting aside um, people rolling on the floor and all of that. So if we're if we're talking about somebody who does know the word and and um, and understands context, etc. Um, I I, I I kind of want to take what you've told us today and put it in my own words and see if I'm on the right or the wrong track. So um, uh, the two examples that you gave um, from your life were the, uh, um, uh, considering uh, buying a building, right, right and um, so that example, and then considering whether um, you were going to be called to be a pastor or a missionary. And with both of those, um, what I did not hear is, you know, you, a seasoned believer, were um, in your own time in the word, not plucking it out like this, but, you know, um, and it's a decision that you're, you're very desperate to make, you've been asking God for, and now in your normal reading, not today in the word, but in your normal reading, the, the verse that you come on that morning, like the very next one, that it seems to speak to what you're asking. Is that using God's word to direct you, or in, is that not? Well, to me, it feels like that would be. Right, it, that, that, and when I say that there's a nuance, did everybody understand her, what she was saying, the, the question? 
Okay, there, there's, there, there, there's two ways to allow the Bible, and more than two ways, but you mentioned two ways to allow the Bible to help you make decisions. One is that, right? Okay, and, and all of a sudden, there I am. I, I've, I've got my verse, and whatever the verse says, I'm going to interpret it to mean what I want it to mean. Or you are in your normal Bible studies, and you're reading through the Word, and you are struggling with a, uh, a, a decision that has to be made, and all of a sudden, there it is. No, but I'm not that you're not saying that. Let's set aside plucking. We no, I said this. We're not saying, but, right. but, but a way that I am saying, the examples that you gave of, of um, you guys decided against the building, not because in your normal reading there was a verse that right. said right. that, right? right. So that right. was right. not right. what right. Right. Or not a mission. It, okay. The example that you gave was not from in your normal reading. God instructed you that it was a right. Um, so well, okay, okay. Let me, let me back up. I'm just struggling of how okay. People are into something specific from the word on a particular person on a particular day, not this. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, and the question is, 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 okay, maybe we have three options. The the first option that I said that this option that's really not an option. Okay, that's really not e even in the ballpark. But the question is, actually, does, a, d does God sometimes lead you in your normal reading of the scripture to a passage that um, answers your question or speaks to you in a very strong way? Or is it just him speaking in a very strong way, but using passages that you might have read 15 years ago? But that's your understanding of scripture. And my answer is yes. It's a both and. Sometimes he does it one way, sometimes he does it both uh, the other way, but both times he's using scripture to illuminate you and apply it to whatever situation you're in. Because you're, you're going to be in many different situations. And, and you know what happens to me r r so often is I'll be struggling with an issue. And I'll, 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 I'll look, I'll, I'll, I'm terrible with references. Right? So I'll know it's somewhere in, in, in these books, and so I'll do my search on a word that I can remember that is in there. And, and it's almost inevitably, when I'm reading through the answers, I'll find another verse that comes up as part of that search that, boy, that's exactly what I need to hear. Right, I didn't even think I was looking for it, but, but there it is. Now, to me, that's the Holy Spirit illuminating me to the word, bringing to my remembrance, maybe using the tools of a computer search engine, maybe using other things, but utilizing tools to bring to my remembrance the things that he's already taught me. Okay, And I know it's there, I just don't know where it is. I know what I'm looking for, and the verse that I'm looking for, yes, does answer what I'm, I'm thinking, but this one answers it so much more. And not only does it answer it, it's part of a chapter that's tailor-made for what I'm trying to find. So that's, that's exactly what we're talking That's the Holy Spirit working within the confines of the Word to illuminate you and apply it. That's the perfect example. Yeah, that's a great example. Yes, sir? You can get it out of context if you do that. Not necessarily. Like or missionary, both are godly choices. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still kind of confused. Are we left directionless? Are we left to either or, and if it's not the right one, like we're going to get wiped out, it should have been the other one? Because you say we should pray, right? And like, and ask for guidance and for God to lead us. Well, what are we expecting? Are we, what are we expecting when we say that, when we ask for that? Um, are we asking God to have a personal communication with us in one way or another to lead and direct which way we should go. Right. So like if it's like, you know, I'm on a scripture and also it's talking about, you know, we're reading about Paul and Paul's like the greatest missionary ever. And it's like, oh, that means I'm supposed to be a missionary. missionary. But, right. but, but, but in reality, no, that doesn't mean I'm supposed to be a missionary. It means Paul was supposed to be a missionary. He's the one that I want to do the least, but that's like just as arbitrary to me at least. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because underneath that statement, and again, Will, there are different decisions that we make of different intensities. 
you know what I mean? And, and when, when that happens to me, normally I'm looking for an illustration for a sermon when, when that occurs. So I'm not looking for a major um, a change or event in my life. Those are the scary ones. And, and, and that's when, again, I, I think that just like God used the particular gifts that he had given Jeremiah to write that book, he made Jeremiah as he is, right? So he made me like I am. So there are some things that I can do that aren't trying to find what God says in his word that use the rational mind that God has given me. And I'm, 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 my boundaries are all the boundaries of scripture, but I still am going to pull out the legal pad and put a line down the middle of it and say, these are the pluses and minuses. And, and if see how those actually line up, okay, of the pluses, which one of them are really godly and the minuses, which ones are godly. And if it comes down, there are, there, there, there's, no, there's no one size fits all here. But the, the situation is that if you are immersed in the word, you're, 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 you're going to eventually know what the, the Lord has, has got to say. Now, th there's a couple of rules of thumbs that you can follow. And one of those rules of thumbs is blossom where you're planted. If the Lord doesn't open a door, we talk about opening doors all the time. We talk about moving and making decisions to go someplace else. And, and, it, and if you, you, it's like when you're in love, you know you're in love. You, you just, you're in love, right? And, and, and if, you, if you wonder, am I in love? Well, then you're not in love right? If you're worrying about whether I'm in love or not, then you're not in love. When you're in love, you know it. And when the Lord leads you and verifies it both by an outer and an inner call, that's what is so wonderful about service to the Lord, is that it's not just you coming up with, hey, I want to be a pastor. It's you being called to be a pastor or being called to be a missionary, right? And so if, if, if I'm not called to be a pastor, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blossom where I'm planted. And I'm going to wait for the Lord's timing. That's the hardest thing for us to do. I've got a decision to make, and I've got to make my decision one way or the other, all right? And the Lord is not, I'm not getting any direction. I'm finding no direction in prayer. I'm not finding any, uh, 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 as, as the Lord is giving me discernment in this thing. So I stay where I am. Okay, that's, that's a rule of thumb. Because guess what? Let's not forget that God is sovereign and that what he wants out of us is obedience and submission and surrender. If you are obedient and submitted and surrender to him and you don't know what he wants you to do, guess what? He's going to do it and you're simply going to follow. Okay, He's going to pay the path for you that he wants for your life because he's sovereign. When we talk about, you know, me getting involved with his plans for my life, all I can do is muck it up, right? I want his will to be manifest in my life. I want him to guide me and direct me and lead me. And so if, like being a pastor here, okay, um, I had the greatest gig in the world. I'm telling you, I had the greatest gig. I was traveling the world. I was going to uh, far off places I was being taken everywhere, always sit in the front of the bus, being taken to see everything that wherever I was, whether it was the Andes, whether it was Africa, whether it was Eastern Europe, whatever it was. I was, because I was taking videos, I, I was making videos for missionaries. I, I mean, what a great gig. You couldn't ask for a better gig. I had, I had trips planned to China uh, at the time that, that, that the Lord called me to this church. <laughs> You know, and uh, it's like, okay, um, do, do, I <laughs> do I really want to do that? Um, and so I didn't do anything for a while because I didn't know what to do. But over the course of time, my heart was broken for this church. And I had real solid manifestation in the change in me because God was molding me to his will, okay? And, and, and that's why I'm here. 
And that's why I'll be here until he moves me. And, and when I say that, I'm not looking for a sign or a fleece. I just know that God's in control of my life. And I relish the fact that he's in control of my life. And my prayers will always reflect that I want him to remain in control of my life. And I don't always know when I have to make a decision. But we, we pray that if, if, if we don't know what to do, that he will direct us and guide us. And I think he does. But I think he does it by bringing scripture to our attention. Right. Yes, sir. When it came to that uh, decision about buying the building, that was kind of an easy one. God gave you the wisdom to know that, okay, this deal doesn't feel right. right. So I would guess that all the elders were unanimous on walking away from that one because there were plenty of signs. Well, well you, you, that's a great example because our hearts wanted that building. It was perfect. I mean, and we, we wanted it. We were talking about stretching and finding ways to, I mean, it's, I mean, the, the, right now we'd have that building filled with students and we'd be making a huge impact. It made perfect sense to us. So when we prayed for discernment and we specifically prayed for the, the deal itself, um, that, okay, this sounds like a good deal to us, Lord, and, and if it's not, then would you please bring it to our attention? No sooner have we done that than the guy gets greedy and changes the deal substantially on us. And so, right, good stewardship, good solid Christian teaching on what we should do to be, you know, to be as wise as foxes and innocent as doves. Is it wise if, yeah, foxes or snakes? Snakes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's, it's, it's close. <laughs> but the, 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 the ability to make that decision was that we know human nature because that's our worldview. And our worldview is such that we learned in the scripture. So, so yes, we made the decision that we didn't want to make. And you remember that. Well, we didn't want to make that, did we? I mean, we were all for it. We were just gung-ho. I mean, this, is, this has got to be the Lord's will, right? It, it's like it dropped in our lap. Everything is just perfect. We, but no, it wasn't. And he made that evident to us. So that, it, it, again, it doesn't mean God's not involved with our life. It doesn't mean he's not speaking to us. It doesn't mean that he's not sovereign and directing us. What it means is that what he wants us to do is to lean on him, to trust in him, to seek his will and not our own. And through that, we will learn what he wants out of every single Christian, which is total surrender and submission. Now, I don't want to hear anyone say, God said to me. Okay? I know that that's vernacular. I know that a lot of people say that, and it is vernacular. But just, just, just know um, um, that, that even though Scripture speaks about a still small voice, he doesn't form little thoughts in your mind. And you, then you find a way to justify it from Scripture. He's a lot more obvious than that. He's pretty clear. Yes. Samuel didn't think it was very obvious. Right? God was calling Samuel. Yeah. Yes. And it need and it took an elder like Eli right. say, "No, that's God talking to you." Right. Uh, so is it always obvious? Uh, well, obvious. He's good, uh, for one thing. <laughs> no, no, it's not always obvious, and that's the whole problem. It, it is not obvious to us, and, and so therefore, when we make those decisions, where no, you can't leave. No, 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 I'm sorry. Somebody hit her with a... I'm, tell me your name again. Uh, it's a very interesting name. Macbella, named after Abraham's tomb. Okay? So, and you're welcome, and we're very happy to have you here. And please, I, I embarrass everyone, including myself. So, God bless you. We look forward to seeing you next week. Macbella, what a beautiful name. All right. Yes, ma'am. Do you ever think uh, that people are wanting answers to things that they shouldn't even be thinking about? Like, I don't need to sit and wait on God to tell me whether I should get a Ford or a Chrysler. You know? um, 
things like that they were I mean we're just supposed to make the uh, trust our decisions and God can let us know if there's you know some big reason he wants us to have a for it, you know. Um, um, I, 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 um, good. So that's a great question, and 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 a, and a deep one that actually we we don't have a perfect answer for, because there are people who are just walking that close to the Lord, that it, it, He's involved with virtually every decision. Some of it is vernacular, some of it is people using that language to say, you know, should I have a, a Chevy or, or a Ford? Um, it's not that God is not concerned about whether or not you're going to have a Chevy or Ford, because actually that Ford might be the one whose engine is going to die for you right in the middle of, of, of an intersection. And not that I have anything against Fords, but that you get hit and they would end your life. So God is going to direct you to a Chevy over the Ford. I'm not saying that if God is, is sovereign in your life. There are people who do that. When we were in Haiti, regularly, when I first started going, I was going with other people. It was not, we almost always, we got in the car, we prayed that God would get us where we were going because you're traveling through areas that aren't really safe and you're not traveling in the best of vehicles. Um, so, I mean, that's not a, 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 a nonsensical prayer that, you know, Lord, would you bless us when we travel and get us to our destination? Um, but I do think that quite often people throw that around, and that is dangerous. When you throw it around like you are walking and talking with God, and there's this relationship that you have with him, and I've got, let me go to the Lord and ask him what he wants me to do. That, that, that I think, is very dangerous, because you, then, then what you're doing is making a decision and putting God's name on it. Right. 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 Do you remember? Do you remember, uh, do you remember anybody remember Jim Ingalls from uh, uh, Coleridge? He was a, a pastor, and, and he made a great analogy one day, he, he, and I use it all the time. He, he said that when we do things like that, it's like shooting an arrow at a barn and then going and drawing a bullseye around it, right? And saying, "Look what God did," right? And and people do that all the time. They they shoot an arrow at the barn, boom, they go draw a bullseye and say, this is God's will. Not always, all right? You know, draw the bullseye first. <laughs> no. Um, but nonetheless, yes, that, that can be very, very dangerous when it's like I ask God everything to do. I, I can remember when, when I was a kid and I had that charismatic experience that I thought I was saved, but I wasn't. I can remember walking across a golf course at night with a guy much older than I was, but he was like in the spirit. And he would walk this way, and then he would walk that way, and then he would dramatically change his direction. It's like, where are you going? We're going right there. The Lord's leading me. There's something here he wants me to see. The Lord is leading me in my direction. I'm sitting there, wow, heavy. You know, really impressionable at the time. But, uh, you know, he's just, he's just putting God's name on it. God's not doesn't do that. He doesn't deal in a chaotic way, you know. And, and he's pretty. Uh, um, when he speaks, the guy wrote a book and and and, and coined the phrase, um, "God doesn't whisper," you know. And when he speaks, he doesn't whisper. You, you you're going to hear his voice, and when he got you directed, you're going to know that that's where he wants to go. And if he doesn't, blossom in the mud puddle. We're going to have to call this to a close, guys. Um, I mean, we could stay here uh, for longer, but we got started a little bit late, so it's not, uh, not too far over. But thank you for all your questions. They, these are, um, it, it is so, this is a big one. This is a huge one in the church today. How does God speak to us? And we are in such a minority. You cannot believe the minority that we are in that maintains that God speaks to us through his word, the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's it. All right, let me pray and I will let you all go. Father, actually when we delve into this subject, and you know this, it brings up so many questions. Because if, if, if misunderstood, then the question would have to be raised, well, why should we pray at all? 
if you're not going to answer our prayers, if you're not going to change your mind, um, what, does, what part does prayer have in all of this? But we know you're sovereign, and, and we know that at the same time you call us to pray to you. And so there's some things that we are just not going to have the answer to, that we have to use your word as closely as we can, and then to proceed on faith, to proceed on the kind of faith that you generate in us through the study of your word. And I just thank you again so much for that. Where would we be without your word? And where would we be without the conviction that to know your word is, the, is ground zero? That's where we start and we build from there. Thank you for these people who are um, willing to stay after and to talk even more fully. Uh, we'll give you the glory in Christ's name. Amen.